A few weeks ago, I posted a video of Miss Cool's new custom steel bike. And in that video, we went through the process of acquiring all the parts, assembling the bike, and going out on a test ride. Later on, we posted another video where Miss Cools talked about the bike in more detail, but what we did not discuss is the unconventional design of the bike frame. Some of you asked if we'd be uh, able to talk a little bit more about those design features. So in this video, I'm gonna go through a few of those design features but I'm gonna focus mainly on one, and that is the top tube diameter. The top tube of Miss Cool's bike was oversized for a very specific reason, and that is something that is typically unconventional to do, but I wanna talk about why we did that uh, for Miss Cool's bike. Now, one uh, disclaimer here, all the tube sizes, all the thicknesses were picked out by the frame builder John Fitzgerald, who built the bike for Miss Cools. The only thing that uh, we added to the discussion was the oversized top tube. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull up this 3D analysis tool that I created for Miss Cools before she had the bike frame built. And we use this model to figure out how to stiffen the frame up to best suit her needs. And her needs are, she wanted a bike that could do daily riding, that was still light and lively, but also on occasion take it bike touring. So it had, those were the parameters that we were trying to work within. So in order to achieve that goal, I came up with a 3D model and I ran through a series of different load cases and I'm going to share with you the results of that analysis. Now I'm gonna show you this 3D model as well. It's very complicated. And in order to keep this video short, I'm not gonna go through all of the modeling assumptions and all the loads because it's very complicated. If there's enough people out there that really wanna see this model in great detail and they want me to go through all the details of it, I will be happy to make another video. Just let me know if that's what you're interested in seeing and I will go through it with a fine tooth comb and we can talk about whatever interests and maybe we'll do it as a, as a live video because I've never actually done a live video, but maybe we'll do that one as a live video if that works. If not, I can just record the whole thing and you know post it like a traditional video. Okay, so let me bring up the model just so you can get a sense of it here. And I'll just give you a little overview. This is the model. Here's a two dimensional view of it. Uh, here's an isometric view of it. These are lines that represent the tubes. The tubes were modeled as cylinders, all of them. Uh, the thicknesses of the model, the thickness of the tubes were all based on what John Fitzgerald sent us in his fit sheet. These are shown graphically, they are not to scale. They just give you an idea of what it looks like. The fork was modeled as a straight line segment. The offset here, which is a line, if you take an imaginary line through the head tube, and you measure that the perpendicular offset, that would be the correct distance for her fork offset, which provides the correct fork uh, or the, the trail of the bike, as it says, as they say. Bottom bracket drop is modeled. All the tube lengths, the shapes and everything are modeled uh, to scale. So the top tube slope is 2%. The bottom bracket is 75 millimeters. The chain stay lengths, all the lengths of the tubes, everything is modeled accurately. Okay, so what are the results of the analysis? Uh, let me pull up my spreadsheet. I know everyone cannot wait for a spreadsheet, but here it is, and I, I have to do this uh, for, I had to kind of organize this in a spreadsheet so it's clear to see, but uh, yeah, anyway, let's just go through it. So the first row is standard, standard, and what that means is standard top tube, standard down tube. This is the reference design. If Miss Cools were to use standard diameter tubing throughout the whole bike, this would be the displacements of the bike, the vertical and lateral displacements based on the load cases that I ran on this bike. And I'll show, maybe I'll show some of those load cases here at the end. So if Miss Cools were to have done her bike more traditionally, that is with a standard top tube and an oversized down tube, which is the traditional way of stiffening up a frame, so the percent difference in terms of lateral uh, would be 55% compared to the 
standard standard, but she didn't choose that. She went with oversize standard. So she went with this row. She chose oversize standard and that provided a 20% increase in lateral stiffness and only a 1.3% increase in vertical stiffness. You don't wanna increase the vertical stiffness of the bike. The vertical stiffness is where you get your compliance. So the, the less increase in stiffness, the better. However, she was able to get about a 20% increase in lateral stiffness. Some of you would say, but wouldn't you want 55% increase in stiffness? We'll get back to that in a second. So just hold that idea for a second here. We'll come back to that. Now, if we went oversize, oversize, the bike would be 76% stiffer laterally and 4% stiffer vertically. Okay, so let's go back to the model. Why didn't we go with an oversize, oversize? So if we go through these load cases, I'm gonna show you the, the couple different load cases that we used to, mod, to run on this frame. And uh, this particular load case we applied was a torsional load case at the top, at the head tube, top tube joint, and at the bottom bracket. And that torsional load case is if you are, assume you are standing up out of the saddle, climbing up a hill, and you're pulling up on your handlebar and pushing down on the crank at the same time. You would be applying a torque. A torque, there would be a torque on the bottom bracket due to the eccentricity of the crank, and there would be a torque at the head tube due to the eccentricity of the handlebars. So that's what this load case does. And what this does, if we run this model, I'll show you what it does. We'll run this model. If we run this model, what happens is you get, you get the frame torquing. I don't know if you can see this, but the, the purple or the pink line is the displaced shape of the model as we torque on it. And you can see that the top, the head tube, top tube bends laterally out of plane, as well as the bottom bracket. So this is if you were climbing out of the saddle. Now this is just a static load. We were modeling it as a static load. In reality, there would be, it would be a dynamic load. It would be alternating back and forth. But this just gives you the maximum deflection at the worst case scenario of Miss Cool standing up out of the saddle. And actually, I need to take off this restraint up here. I think that makes, hold on. Let me take off this boundary condition up here because we don't, when you're standing up out of the saddle, you don't have a restraint up here at the top, at the uh, seat tube where the, where the seat tube or seat post mounts into the frame. So I need to actually turn that off for this to be more accurate. Um, we'll use that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. So I'm gonna remove that restraint right there. Let me rerun this model. Solve. Okay, there we go. So that looks a little better. So now you can see that this node three moves, even though there's nothing touching it up here, you're not touching the bike up here because of the load on the frame, because this is pushing over, it actually causes the seat tube to arc a little bit. Now this frame uh, deflection diagram is exaggerated for effect. It's scaled up. It's not shown, it's just for graphical uh, representation. Okay, so that's that case. And uh, let's look at this other case here for a second. I'm going to show you another case just for fun. Uh, here's the vertical load case. So we're going to solve for that. If we bend this frame vertically, we just sit on it. Here's your vertical load displacement diagram. I think this one's really interesting because it shows how much the bottom bracket moves and how much the fork bends as well as this front triangle. It shows you how much curvature and bending there is in this front end of the bike, how much displacement is happening here, and how little displacement is happening here in the rear triangle. A lot of people have said that bikes are very stiff vertically, and they are, but with the nice flexible fork and flexible tubes and a long head tube, you actually get a lot more displacement and, and compliance, as it's called, in the front end of the bike. How much is it? Well, let's see. So if we were to look at node four, and that would be kind of where your stem is mounted to the bike. Node four displaces about a millimeter, so not a lot. And this is just with Miss Cool sitting on it. But one millimeter is, what does that mean? 
How much is a millimeter? Does that mean anything? Does that even, can you even feel a millimeter? Well, put it in context, a bicycle tire that is inflated will deflect between four and five millimeters depending on the air pressure and the weight. So this is deflecting one millimeter. So it's about a quarter of the tire deflection. So, so it's, not, it's not as much as a tire, but it's actually more than I would have expected, actually. I would have thought there was less deflection. But a quarter is still something, and, I, and I'm sure if we stiffened it up, you would definitely feel the difference in stiffness if we put a really rigid fork on it or something like that. Anyway, that's the vertical load. I want to show you this other case one. This is the last load case I'll show you because I know everyone's time is limited and uh, we're going to turn off this uh, diagram. Okay, so the last case is this 10 pound load here. Now why I did this is because when I was out riding my bike, I was curious what is causing the top tube head tube joint to be so flexible. So what I did is I put a 10 pound load applied directly up here and I looked at how much the frame will deflect with that load. And you can see there's your deflection diagram. So it pushes the frame over and now when I bring up my Excel sheet you can see the lateral deflection. The lateral deflection at the top tube, so that's this tab here. So with that, here's what I thought was really fascinating. According to convention, if you had a standard, standard bike and you applied that lateral load to the top tube, then if you, well, here's the standard, standard. If you, um, oh, and that's point, is that right? We better check that. So note four, joint deflections, note four and the Z, is 3.25. Now in my table, I said six, but that's because I actually ran more load. I think at that time I ran uh, 25 pounds, I think is what it was. So let's go ahead and pull up the base. Uh, let's see. Let me pull up the loads. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Let's go ahead and increase this to 25. I'm pretty sure I ran 25 pounds. So let's do that. Let's rerun this with 25 pounds. Make sure that the numbers, yeah. Okay, so now the joint four is, well, that's eight. Oh man, that's eight. Is that what I, note I was using? Six, okay, maybe I used 20 pounds. 6.45, okay, let's do a little less. A little less, sorry. I, I should have had this all prepared. Let's try 20. Point 0.65, okay, so 6.5, 6 that's what standard, standard, 6.4, so that's close enough. All right, so anyway, what this spreadsheet is showing is that if we put that lateral load just at the top tube of both of all three bikes, so a standard diameter bike, a standard with an oversized down tube, and an oversized with a standard down tube, so an oversized top tube, standard down tube. So this line is Miss Cool's bike. This line is a bike that you just oversize the down tube. So as you can see, what's interesting here is that on the percent difference, even though Miss Cool's bike, Miss Cool's bike had 11.5% increase in lateral stiffness compared to only eight when you oversize the down tube. Now we did this specifically because we wanted to make sure that her bike would not shimmy, first of all, and we wanted to be able to carry weight on the front of the bike. And that often, when you put load on the front of the bike, it tends to cause the bike to want to shimmy. And so we were trying to avoid that. Her bike needs to be good for touring and for daily riding. Now my bike has standard tubing all the way around and I do get a shimmy if I take my hands off the bars. Well, if I'm riding fast down a hill and I just try to ride no-handed, the bike will shimmy. So we wanted to do everything we could to avoid that. And as you can see from this result, 
if you just oversize the down tube, you're only increasing that top tube to head tube joint by 8%. Whereas if you oversize the top tube, you increase the top tube head tube joint by almost 12%. And so from a weight optimization standpoint, that seemed to make the most sense for her, for her bike. Anyway, um, I know this was a really complicated subject and uh, I would be happy to go through this. Um, I have another video planned. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run a dynamic analysis on her bike because I have heard uh, by reading through different online forums, particularly Bicycle Quarterly, where they describe this concept or this idea where the bike gets in sync with your pedal strokes. And so because I have this model now, I ran through a series of a dynamic, I did a dynamic analysis and I was able to see and determine the different modes of vibration of a bicycle frame. And now I can compare that to a typical rider, uh, depending on how much they weigh and what their pedal cadence is. We can see if that particular person on that bike at that weight would be likely to have a better result uh, than somebody who's riding, say, a, heavy, a stiffer frame bike. So we're gonna save the dynamic analysis for another video, but for this one, in conclusion, now you know why Miss Cools used an oversized top tube.